Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Ray Michnow, I'm the treasurer of the uh, Newington Chamber of Commerce. I'm also on the, um, the board of directors of the Chamber of Commerce and part of the business seminar committee. So uh, the Newington Chamber, we do business seminars throughout the year about various topics of interest to small businesses and business owners. Um, we're, we're pleased to co-host with the Connecticut Paid Leave um, uh, group this, this webinar today. So just real quick, an introduction of who we are, the Newington Chamber. Um, we're a, obviously a local chamber of commerce, specifically around the Newington area. Um, we're a volunteer organization of business people. Uh, we work together to advance economic, commercial, and civic development and the, the needs of our community. Um, we're a network of local leadership. Uh, we, we do things like obviously networking events, uh, education for our members, promotion, marketing of our members. Um, so again, if you're interested, if you're a local small business owner, or you're interested in other presentations like this, you don't necessarily have to be a member of the chamber to participate in these business seminars. We, we do advertise them through the library, the Lucy Robbins Wells Library, um, as well as through our social media. Um, but we certainly encourage you, if you're interested, uh, take a look at our website and think about joining uh, either our chamber or your own local chamber if you're not from the Newington area. So as I said, this is one of the topics that we um, we're, we're happy to present to our members and we'll have other topics coming up in the future. So thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Ray, for having us. My name is Erin Choquette and I am the General Counsel for the Connecticut Pay Leave Authority and I'm joined today by my colleague, Chris Floyd. I just need to get the screen to advance, there we go. And we are, uh, who is the Acting Chief Operating Officer? Chris and I have been um, working with our small but mighty band um, of the nine of us to get the Connecticut Pay Leave Authority up and running and the program operational. Chris manages the operations for the Leave Authority um, after 20 years plus of working in various enterprises, um, including healthcare and health insurance, um, including such stalwarts as Aetna, Connecticut, and Yukon. She's been very active in the community and has been a star at the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority trying to get us up and running. I have been um, working for the state for over 14 years, most recently at the Department of Administrative Services. And I have, um, in my legal career, I've spent a great deal of time working on advising agencies and clients in my private practice an FMLA, and so we're both very pleased to be here today. We've got a chock full agenda. We wanna make sure we have time for questions. Uh, we do ask that you use the Q&A function on the Zoom to help us keep track of your questions and make sure that we are responding to them. That's the better way of doing it compared to chat. But we'll just jump straight in with an overview of the program, um, a review of some of the key dates. And then we wanna discuss a little bit about the Connecticut FMLA, which is related to, but different from the Connecticut Paid Leave Act. And then talk about the process for applying for paid leave benefits, the role of the employer, and then some additional resources, including information on how to register your business if you haven't done so already. So the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority is a quasi-public agency, and it was created by statute in 2019 based on the recognition that Connecticut families need a little bit of help. The, there are existing laws that allow people to take time off from work to care for themselves or loved one, but they can't, people aren't able to access those laws if they can't afford to be without their income. And so the Paid Leave Authority serves to fill that gap by enabling people to have um, access to income replacement while they're out on leave. And our role is also to help employers, third-party administrators, healthcare providers, and everyone who's involved in the process by helping them understand what their roles are and helping them fulfill those responsibilities. At the Connecticut Pay Leave Authority, we have multiple statutory responsibilities, including outreach and engagement, which is one of the reasons why we love uh, participating in webinars and working with the various chambers of commerce and other organizations to get the word out about the program. 
we have to obviously set up our organization and develop the policies and procedures needed to run it. One of those things is to establish the contribution rate, which is set by statute, or the maximum contribution is set by statute at one half of 1%, which is the current contribution rate. If in the future, the program is solvent enough, we can reduce the contribution rate. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the private plan option later on this evening. One of our responsibilities is to approve and audit private plans, which is an alternative to having employees participate in the public paid leave program. And then starting next January, in January of 2022, uh, individuals can file claims for income replacement benefits or leave benefits, and we'll be responsible for administering those claims. The first question we've been asked since we started doing outreach and engagement is, who's involved in this? Who's covered by this law? And the answer is almost everybody. It's a very broad definition. And basically any employer who has one or more people working in Connecticut is covered by the law. Uh, nonprofits and private sector employers with unionized workforces are covered. They're part of the program. The statute identifies certain groups that are excluded, who are not part of the program. And those groups include employees of the federal government, it also includes the state of Connecticut, except as to covered public employees, which I'll define in a moment. Municipalities and local or regional boards of education are excluded unless they have covered public employees. Non-public elementary and secondary schools are also excluded. And these exclusions basically mirror the exclusions under Connecticut FMLA. Our statute says that sole proprietors and other self-employed individuals are not required to participate, but they do have the opportunity to choose to opt in if they would like to. If they do so, they have to stay in the plan for at least three years. So as I said, the state and municipalities have this thing called covered public employees. Basically, um, if you are a covered public employee, you contribute into the Connecticut Paid Leave Program and you will have the ability to apply for benefits. Those covered public employees include non-unionized employees of the state, as well as any unionized employees if their union collectively bargains to be included. In addition to those state employees, or state of Connecticut employees, if the employees, um, of a municipality or a local or regional board of education are unionized and the unionized employees collectively bargain to, to be included in the program, then all of the employees of that town or board of education would come along and be included. And just here on the slide, we, we show the definition we're using for municipality, which is consistent with the, um, the statute that relates to collective bargaining in municipalities. So as I said, we have our first responsibility is to manage the contributions. The Connecticut Paid Leave Program is entirely employee funded. Uh, there is no employer match. So what happens is the employee is responsible for contributing one half of 1% of their wages, but the employer is responsible for remitting those contributions as well as some minimal wage information to the authority. We receive the contributions validate that wage information and deposit the contributions into the paid leave trust. The paid leave trust is administered by the office of the state treasurer, um, but it can only be used for the functions of the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority to fund the benefits and, and pay for our administrative costs. It cannot be used for any other purposes in state government. These contributions are post tax and Basically, the definition for wages for purposes of the contribution is the same as the definition that employers are already using when they calculate FICA, um, their employees' FICA obligations. The other thing to know about contributions is that they're capped at the Social Security contribution max. So just as employees stop contributing to Social Security once they hit that contribution max, they will also stop contributing to the Connecticut Pay Leave Trust. And that social security contribution max just uh, was amended. So it's now 142,400, I believe, just went up in January. 
So just a few key dates to pay attention to as you think about the program and think about getting your business up and ready to comply. Uh, we've been asking employers to register. We actually uh, had set December 31st as the target date to get employers to register and over 40,000 employers have already registered. But if you haven't, you're not too late. Just, and we'll tell you how to do it toward the end of this program. The reason we wanted employers to register before January 1st is because January 1st marked the, the start date for the obligation to take the deductions from the employee's wages. So um, all paychecks after January 1st, 2021 are subject to the one half of 1% contribution. And those uh, contributions will be paid on a quarterly basis. Technically, we have given everyone uh, 30 days after the end of the quarter to get their contributions in. So that's why the um, dates are listed here. We will also be engaging in in February and March, we'll be engaging in reviews for uh, employers who apply for private plans. So that's what we're doing this quarter. Um, contributions will come in every quarter thereafter. And beginning next, next year, um, by December is our goal, we will be allowing individuals to start beginning to submit their applications for benefits. Under the statute, we can't pay any benefits until January 1st, 2022 but we'd like to get ahead of the curve by letting people start getting their applications in a little bit early. And then in January 1st, 2022, uh, we can start issuing benefits. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the Connecticut Paid Leave Act is related to, but slightly different than the Connecticut FMLA. And it really falls into an existing um, universe of other leave laws. And so this slide is really intended just to kind of put us into the context. Under existing law, employers with 50 or more employees have to provide federal family and medical leave. Um, so that's the federal FMLA. Right now, and actually up until January 1st, 2022, the Connecticut FMLA statute applies to employers with 75 or more employees. However, next January, that law will change, and we'll talk about those changes, but one of the most significant is that employers with one or more employees will now be subject to Connecticut FMLA. In addition to the two FMLA laws, workers' compensation has some elements of job protection associated with it. As you know, you can't terminate an employee simply because they filed for workers' comp. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act the, and the Pregnancy Disability Act apply to employers with 15 or more employees. And both of those laws say that you may have to provide leave to an individual um, as a reasonable accommodation to their disability. Additionally, the Connecticut Fair Employment Practices Act, which applies to employers with three or more employees, also says that you may have to consider giving your, um, an employee with a disability leave a job protected leave if that's necessary as a reasonable accommodation. So there are a number of laws that provide job protection, at least consider the possibility of job protection. There haven't been that many laws that provide income replacement. Um, up until now, it's really just been workers comp and that's limited to on the job injuries. But starting in January of 2022, as I said, employers with one or more employees working in Connecticut employees of employers with one or more employees working in Connecticut can apply to the pay leave authority for income replacement during leave. So let's talk a little bit about how the Connecticut FMLA will change. In addition to changing its requirements for who, who's covered by the law, um, from the 75 or more employees down to employers with one or more employees, the eligibility standard for being able to ask for job protected leave will also change. Right now, in order to be able to receive job protected leave, you would have to show that you worked for at least 12 months for that employer and you worked at least a thousand hours during the 12 months immediately before you asked for leave. So basically you get job protection if you take leave after working for 12 months. In 2022, you will get job protection. You can ask for job protected leave once you've worked for the employer for three months. 
And there's no longer going to be any requirement that you've worked a specific number of hours to be able to access that job protected leave. One of the other changes is the amount of leave that will be available. Right now, it says you get 16 weeks of leave in a 24 month period um, with this additional uh, leave available for military caregiver leave. Starting in 2022, that's going to change and you'll get 12 weeks of leave in a 12 month period. Uh, except you'll still get that 26 weeks for military caregiver. And then the statute also says an employee may also be able to access an additional two weeks of leave for uh, incapacity during pregnancy. Finally, under Connecticut FMLA right now, an employer can require an employee to use all of their accrued time if they take leave. Um, that is in the employer's discretion to say, look, that's great, you need to take FMLA but you need to use all your accruals. Under the law as of 2022, the employer can still say you have to use all your accruals, but not quite all. You have to at least let the employee hold on to two weeks of their accrued PTO and, and let them hold that in reserve for reasons other than for taking FMLA leave. All right, so FMLA leave is only available for specific reasons. You have to be able to document that you need leave for one of these several reasons in order for it to be protected. These are also the same reasons that an employee can ask for income replacement from the authority. And the first is for bonding, to bond with a newborn baby or a child who's been placed with your family for adoption or foster care. You can also take caregiver leave, which is leave to care for a family member who has a serious health condition. Additionally, you can take, this is, that's the family side, the medical side is that you can take time off from work for your own serious health condition. And serious health condition is defined as um, conditions for which you're receiving treatment from a medical provider that cause incapacity. And there's actually quite a long definition, but I just wanna flag that it includes serving as an organ or bone marrow donor, and it also includes pregnancy. There are two special um, military family leave available. One is to care for a family member who's injured in the military. And that military caregiver leave is the one that allows you to take 26 weeks of leave. And then there's also something called qualifying exigency leave, which allows an individual to take leave if their family member is called to overseas active duty. And that's for specific reasons like having to um, get a will or update your financial documents or um, attend a, a sending off ceremony, things like that. In addition, Connecticut law has something called family violence leave, which allows individuals to take uh, up to 12 days of leave for reasons associated with family violence, either receiving care or going to court or relocating because they've been subjected to family violence. Now, those leave reasons um, are the same reasons that you would see an employee taking leave under federal FMLA. So that part looks a lot the same, but what's different is the definition of family member. Under federal FMLA and under Connecticut FMLA until it changes in 2022, you would only be able to take caregiver leave if you needed to take time away from work to care for your parent, your spouse, or a child who was under 18 or was 18 and over and had a disability. Under the new Connecticut FMLA that will take effect next year and under the Connecticut Paid Leave Act, the definition of family is much broader and it includes the parent or spouse, it includes a child of any age, son or daughter of any age, as well as your sibling, your grandparent, your grandchild, or an individual related to the employee by blood or affinity whose close association the employee shows to be the equivalent of one of those family relationships. Well, that's a mouthful, right? So that definition is something that's been taken from various federal laws, including federal contractor sick leave laws and federal employee bereavement. And so basically, when we're talking about someone who is related by affinity, you're talking about a person with whom the employee has a significant personal bond that is like one of those relationships, even if there's no biological or legal relationship. In showing that that occurs, it's gonna be very fact specific and you're gonna to have to, the employee is gonna to have to explain to you sort of how this person 
is um, is equivalent to a parent or a spouse or a sibling. Um, but some of the examples could be, um, you know, your aunt or your uncle who, you know, is equivalent to your grandparent. Um, you know, in, in my family, my great aunt was unmarried. She lived, you know, two miles away. She didn't drive. We were the ones who went grocery shopping for her. We were the ones who cared for her when she was sick. She's the one who came to every Christmas, birthday, recital, and the like. Um, she was my grandmother uh, in, in lieu of the one who had, who had passed away when I was three. That would count. Um, uh, unmarried significant other with whom the employee re maintains a familial or spouse-like relationship would count. So those are the things we're talking really about those chosen families. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the length of leave, but I just wanted to make sure it's sort of all available to you in one place. So for federal FMLA, you get 12 weeks of leave in a 12 month period, except for that military caregiver, you get extra time. As I mentioned, starting in 2022, Connecticut FMLA will also be 12 weeks of leave in a 12 month period. But as we've noted, there's the 26 weeks for military caregiver, there's 12 days for family violence, and um, you might be able to get an additional two weeks of leave for that incapacity during pregnancy. An employee who needs income replacement while they're out of work can get income replacement for up to 12 weeks in a 12 month period for all leave reasons, including military caregiver. We, we don't have, our statute does not provide income replacement for the full 26 weeks. Additionally, you can receive income replacement from the authority for those 12 days for family violence, as well as the two additional weeks of, of incapacity during pregnancy. Eligibility requirements for federal FMLA are the 12 months and 1,250 hours in the 12 months immediately preceding leave. So similar, a little bit more stringent, but similar to what Connecticut FMLA says right now. But starting in January of 2022, Connecticut FMLA says, just have to be employed for three months, that's it. And there won't be an hours worked requirement. To be eligible for income replacement benefits, we don't actually look at how long you've been employed because our statute says it really matters how much you've earned from one or more employers. So we look to see did the person asking for income replacement benefits earn at least $2,325 in their highest earning quarter when you look at the first four of the most recent five quarters? And they also have to show that they're currently employed and working in Connecticut, or they had been employed and working in Connecticut during the 12 weeks immediately preceding the leave. Um, this gives some protection to individuals who don't qualify for job protected leave, but still need who still can't work because of a qualifying condition and thus need some income replacement. Additionally, a sole proprietor or, or self-employed individual who's opted to participate in the plan and meets the earning requirement would be eligible for leave. I'm sorry, would be eligible for income replacement benefits. Okay, so I think most of the people on this call are employers and so we want to talk a little bit more specifically about what you do, what will be your role. And really, you have the responsibility to answer these two questions. Anytime an employee asks for time away from work for potentially FMLA qualifying reason, you need to think, is the employee eligible for job protection or job protected leave? And is the employee eligible for income replacement? Both of these questions really need to be assessed each time an employee asks for time away from work for one of those reasons I listed before. Because the eligibility standards are different, you could have an employee who's only eligible for federal FMLA or only eligible for Connecticut FMLA, or they might be eligible for both federal and state FMLA, in which case the leaves would run concurrently. Or you could have someone who's not eligible for leave under either of those statutes, but may be entitled to job protected leave as a reasonable accommodation under the ADA or CFIPA or PDA and they may not be entitled to any job protected leave at all. So making the determination about eligibility for leave is the employer's responsibility and they have to do so in accordance with the laws. Uh, 
So when they do so, they're going to look at these standards. The employer also has to think about whether the employee is eligible for income replacement. Now, this requires a little bit of coordination with the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. The employer will decide, is the employee eligible for income replacement based on the employer's own policies? So if you have sick leave or vacation leave or PTO policies, what do they say? Is the employee eligible for those? And do they have enough time? An employee could receive benefits from both the authority and the employer, as long as the combined amount does not exceed 100% of the employee's regular wages. Uh, an employee may also be able to have access to short-term or long-term disability benefits, but whether they can receive that before or after or at the same time as benefits from the authority really depends on the terms of those specific policies. Usually those policies say that you have to, an employee would have to use the state provided benefits first. So they'd have to come to the authority first and exhaust that before they'd be eligible for um, benefits from an insurance policy. I think it's worth pointing out that the statute says if you're receiving workers' compensation, you cannot receive benefits from the paid leave authority. You have to pick one or the other. As we've noted, sometimes employees may not be entitled to job protected leave, but they still can't work. And in those situations, they may be eligible to receive income from uh, the authority. Finally, with those private plans, the employee, if the employer has a paid leave authority approved private plan, so the employees are not participating in the public program, they're not making contributions to the paid leave trust. Instead, the employer is um, administering a private plan on behalf of the employees, then the employer will decide if the employee is eligible for benefits. So how do employees apply to the authority for benefits? Well, we are in the process of, um, we have an RFP out for a third party administrator to handle claims administration. So I can't give you a lot of details, but I can tell you that we anticipate having it be as um, simple and streamlined as possible with minimum burden to the employees and minimal burden to the employers. We anticipate it'll be a primarily online application process. When the employee applies, we will validate if the employee is eligible based on their earnings, as well as whether the leave reason qualifies. We have to calculate the benefit amount, but we have to offset the benefit from employer provided time off. So we will be communicating with the employee and the employer uh, to determine if there are any offsets. We also need to validate when the employee is actually out of work. A lot of times, um, you know, the employee may have a general sense of when the babies do or when their surgery will happen, but we would need to work with the employee and the employer to actually get the dates squared away. And importantly, when they come back to work and then we issue the benefit payment. So benefit payment depends upon how much the employee earns. And the statute sets out two different calculations. If the employee earns less than or equal to the minimum wage multiplied by 40, then they'll receive 95% of the uh, employee's base weekly earnings. So right now the minimum wage is $12 an hour, 40 times that is 480. So if you have an employee who's earning $480 a week, they would get $456 a week in income replacement from the authority. If the employee is earning more than the Connecticut minimum wage multiplied by 40, it's a two-part analysis. They get the 480 plus 60% of the difference between how much they earn and the Connecticut minimum wage times 40. Um, in all events, the total weekly benefit is capped at 60 times the Connecticut minimum wage. So right now, that would be um, $12 times 60, which is $720. So just like the contributions are capped at the social security contribution limit, the benefits are capped as well. I just have a couple of examples here because I think that they make, it makes the uh, statutory language much more comprehensible if you actually see how the numbers work out. So here we've got Mike who earns $375 a week. That's less than 40 times the minimum wage. So we just do a simple 95% of 375. 
Deborah, on the other hand, earned $700 a week. So we would take the 480 and add to that the difference between 700 and 480, which is 132. And she would get 60% of the 132. So it's 480 plus 60%. And sorry, it's not 132. 60% is 132 of the difference. And so Deborah's weekly uh, income replacement benefit would be $612. So we have a, um, a couple of examples just to see how this all works together. When you think about, is the employee eligible for job protection and what are the income replacement, right? So Acme has 100 employees working in Connecticut and Wiley Coyote is a full-time employee who's worked there for 10 years. So he's got a good amount of accruals built up, including four weeks of sick time and two weeks of vacation. He gets hurt in a non-work-related incident and has to be out of work for eight weeks. We're gonna assume that the employer has a requirement that the employee has to use up any accruals up to the statutory requirement, which would mean up to the two weeks. So every time someone has to be out of work, we think, are they eligible for job protected leave? And are they eligible for income replacement? Here, because ACME has 100 employees, and while he's worked there for such a long time, we're going to assume he's eligible for federal FMLA, that he's worked there for the 12 months and the 1250 hours. We know that since he's been there for 10 years, he's clearly eligible for Connecticut FMLA because you only have to work there for three months. So his federal and state FMLA will both start the first day he's out of work. So in this example, it's February 1st, and we'll run for the eight weeks that he's out. So when he comes back to work, he will have used up eight weeks of his Connecticut FMLA and eight weeks of his federal FMLA, leaving him with four weeks of job protection in the event he gets a similar qualif another qualifying incident sometime in the next 12 months. The employer requires him to use his sick leave accruals. Um, so he uses those sick leave accruals for the first four weeks that he's out, but he's not required to use his two weeks of vacation and so after four weeks, Wiley's gonna to come to the authority and say, please give me income replacement benefits. And those income replacement benefits will cover him for the final four weeks that he's out. Similar example for a smaller employer with 20 employees, so they're not subject to federal FMLA, but we have a part-time employee who is gonna be protected because there's no hours worked requirement. So when Jamie here breaks her leg, we're gonna see that she's eligible for job protection under Connecticut FMLA, and she'll use that job protected leave for the full eight, however many weeks since she was out, um, for the full time that she's out. She's got a couple of weeks of sick leave accruals, so she'll use those first. She's got three weeks of vacation. She's only allowed to hold two weeks in reserve, so the employer is entitled to say, use up a week of your vacation for this. And so the first three weeks will be paid for through her accruals. And then she can receive income replacement benefits from the authority. There are some specific rules if you have spouses who work for the same employer. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go too detailed into that, but it's just um, the idea behind that was if you have a spouses who work for the same employer, the um, the statute allows to the employer to require the employees to share some of their entitlement to minimize the burden to the employer. Okay, the private plans, which um, I've alluded to a few times now, as I said, the statute allows employers to fulfill their obligations in, by allowing them to offer a private plan to their employees instead of having their employees participate in the Connecticut Paid Leave Program. If they obtain a plan that's approved by the authority, the employer, not the authority, will administer the claims for paid leave benefits. If they get an approved plan, the employer is not required to remit those employee contributions to the authority, but they can take that same amount of money as long as they use it for the sole purpose of administering that plan. They can't use the money for anything else. They can't use it for general benefits. It has to be specifically for the paid leave program. 
and the contribution or the withholding cannot exceed the contribution rate. All of the details about the private plan policy uh, are found on our website under I want to apply for a private plan on ctpleave.org. Um, and generally, the private plan must offer the same or better benefits as the public plan, which means it has to provide income replacement for the same leave reasons, for the same amount of time, and the same benefit. Um, generally speaking, a short-term disability policy is not going to cover it because short-term disability policies do not provide income replacement for all of the reasons that you get income replacement under the program. As I said, it cannot cost your employees more than the public plan, and you have to cover everybody. You can't have a private plan for your executive team, but make the warehouse folks go to the public plan. It's, it's an all or nothing deal. Because the Connecticut Paid Leave Program is entirely employee funded, the legislature made a point of saying, the decision to use a private plan really needs to rest with the employees, not the employer. And so the employees have to vote in favor of a private plan. So if you're interested in this option, please go to the website. You'll see all this information. This is a screenshot. We are in the process of finalizing the actual application um, and hope to get that out to the public very soon. Um, so there is um, an opportunity to submit your private plan. As long as you get approved for your private plan before the end of March, you um, will be, you would not have to remit your contributions. However, because there's a chance you might not get approved for your private plan, we do encourage employers to continue to take those contributions through this quarter. Um, and if they get approved for the private plan, they can either give the money back to their employees or use it for purposes of administering the private plan. If they don't take the contributions and don't get approved, then the employer is gonna be on the hook to pay the employee's contributions, which is not uh, a result anybody wants. So, um, as I said, the application process is not available yet, um, but that's okay, because you have a lot to do. You have to find a program, find a private plan, run the vote, and um, get all your documentation in order. So if you're interested, register, indicate that you're interested, go back and complete, um, get all the information you need, obtain a, either a fully insured program or fill out the paperwork for a self-insured program. And then soon you'll be able to submit your application online and then um, we'll move forward from there. We have over a dozen uh, companies that have been approved by the Department of Insurance to offer private plans. So they are out there if you're interested. All right, I'm gonna turn this presentation over to my colleague, Chris, who's gonna tell you about how to register your business. Chris, I can continue, continue to run. Continue. I'll go on mute, I'll go on but I can mute, continue I... to run the slide deck. If you That'd be great. And I will at some point pivot to uh, show the, the public website. Uh, but thank you, Erin. So we wanted to spend a few minutes just to share with you about the process to get registered with the Paid Leave Authority. Um, it is a simple process. Uh, and so there are a couple of things that we'd like to just make sure that you have as information available to you as you start to register. Um, the very first step that you're going to do, and this will start from our website, I will demo it in just a few minutes, is to start at business.ct.gov and to create an account. What that is, is with the state of Connecticut, we are working to create one set of credentials that you will be able to use now uh, and over a multi-year period with different agencies. We, uh, in partnership with the Department of Administrative Services, have been part of their uh, program that has just started to go on this path for a single identity. And the intention is that over a two or three year roadmap, you will continue to use this one set of credentials if you need to do business with the Department of Labor, the Department of Revenue Services, uh, any of the different uh, agencies within the state. That is not, having said that, that's not all launched right now. So we are the first agency where we create that identity um, right up front, and then it allows you to get registered with our, account, with our agency. 
So you'll start and you'll create that account and then you'll complete registration with us. Next slide, please. So in preparing for registration, the things that you'll need to have available to you, uh, you will start at our website, which is ctpaidleave.org. And we have a checklist that's out there on the things that you need, but it's fairly simple. You'll need to have obviously your FEIN number and then your NAICS code, the North American Industry Classification System Code. We have on our website, we have tutorials about how to register, but it really is a very simple process. Next slide. So when you get to the ctpaidleave.org homepage, uh, you will see a get started button and I'll show that in just a few minutes. You'll start the process to create the account with business.ct.gov uh, and they've abbreviated their URL to ct.gov now. And you'll set up that, that state credentials. We recommend that you use Google Chrome uh, as your uh, browser or Microsoft Edge. Uh, Internet Explorer is no longer supported. So uh, if you try to start your, setting up your credentials from an IE Explorer, it will not work. So once you have created those credentials, you'll come back uh, and then you'll log into the ctpaidleave.org website and you'll be able to get started on the registration with our agency. Next slide. In that registration process, you're going to enter several pieces of information. And this is information about you as an employer. Uh, we wanna know the contact information. And, and when we ask for contact information, it's likely someone from your company that handles payroll, benefits administration, HR related uh, information. Uh, and we do want that contact because uh, when we get later in the year, when we need to start validating benefits, your employees are looking to uh, make a leave request, we'll need a contact at your company that we can reach out to to help to validate the information that your employee is providing. Obviously, you'll put in your FEIN number, and then you can add additional uh, business information that'll allow us to know um, what if you're an employer, um, if, you, if you have a third party administrator that uh, potentially supports you uh, in your payroll processing, it allows us to capture that in additional information. In step four of the process, you'll also um, may have other people in your uh, HR or payroll office that you may want to also list as a contact. And we have the ability to collect that information. It's not required but oftentimes we find employers have maybe one or a second person as a backup that they'd like to identify that can help support uh, the business in case that uh, primary person is unavailable. Next slide. Okay, so thank you. So I, I think I'm going to actually, I will come back to this, but I'm gonna first uh, share my screen and just take you to, um, to our public site and, uh, and we'll come back to the slides. So one second. Okay, uh, can everyone, Erin, if you can confirm, can you see the Connecticut Paid Leave homepage? No, not yet. All we see is your um, your internet homepage. Oh, okay. We'll try it again. Now we've got it. Thank you. Okay, and so this is our homepage. Uh, again, our URL address is uh, www.ctpaidleave.org. And when you come to this uh, homepage, you'll see right here on the right-hand side, register your business, get started. And that's the link that I was mentioning just a few minutes ago. As I shared, the very first step that you need to do is to create that account with ct.gov. And so again, the first uh, 
step here is just reminding you of the browsers that are compatible for your setup. And then again, to create an account. I'm gonna take this partially through the process, uh, but we encourage you to go ahead and do this. So, as it loads. Okay, there we go. All right, so you will come to this page for signing up for a ct.gov account. It'll ask you for your first name, last name. It'll ask you to define a username. Please make it something simple that you will remember. And then one of the things that I will stress, uh, the email address, um, you know, the person that will be coming to the site is some type of, you might be the business owner, an administrator on behalf of your business. Um, have the person really just think about what email address do you want to use. We have had um, a lot of registration cleanup where uh, somebody might have used their personal email address, but now they want to really use their business email address. So whoever is the administrator for your business um, that would you know, likely interact with us or come back to the site, you want them to use that email address. So they'll put their email address in, uh, indicate language preference and set up a password, and then uh, come down and sign up for ct.gov. What will happen, it's, this is very simple, you will get an email acknowledgement saying you've had success, you can now continue to register with Connecticut Paid Leave, uh, and so go ahead and sign in. You will also concurrently get an email that will come to your uh, whatever email that you identify and ask you to click the link and verify that this is your email. And you wanna do that right away. We have a lot of uh, employers that we're finding that they forget to click that acknowledgement. So it's a way of us from an identity management ensuring that you're you, you've acknowledged this and you can continue. So I won't go ahead and create a ct.gov account, but that's the very first step that you will need to do. Once that account has been created, you will come back to this page and now it will know that your account has been creative, created. And the next step that will come is uh, this screen will change and it will say now, instead of right now, we're showing you the step two of registering, but now you'll have a, a link that will allow you to go ahead and click and link and begin the registration process. And all of the information that I shared before just a few minutes ago of putting in your company information, contact information, et cetera, is what you will continue to do. When you complete the process with us, you will also get an acknowledgement. So right now what I will do is I'll stop sharing my screen. And then Erin, if you can reshare your slides, we can pick up where we left off. Okay. So what I just took you through was, you know, from the website, these are the activities that you would do to create your ct.gov account. Please go to the next slide. And then um, after you created that step and now you're logged in, I know this is small and the slides will come out um, uh, to you after the webinar, but these are all the fields that you'll need to do because now you are logged into the Connecticut Paid Leave website. And again, we're asking in here, um, first name, last name, your business address, city, state, and zip. Um, we're asking for, uh, again, the email, the primary business uh, contact from your business, the name of the person and that person's email and then uh, letting us know what role you are. Are you an employer? Um, are you a, a third party administrator? And then uh, the last field that's asked is what is your role in the organization? I'm the payroll coordinator, I'm the business owner. Um, those are usually the, the typical roles that people will identify. Next slide, please. Then what we will go through is additional uh, information on behalf of your business. This is where we collect the NAICS code information uh, and then you know, the information specific to your business. Next slide, please. And then additional information will be if, we, if you want to be able to tell us additional people at your company that should be able to um, 
communicate with us, particularly when we get into benefits administration. The NAICS code is also loaded at this time uh, on, the, on the page, the next slide. And then again, um, just additional, um, you're just seeing an additional page for additional users that can be uh, put on the site. And then after you complete that, you will receive a confirmation that your registration has been complete. You'll receive a confirmation that is on the screen, but you will also receive an email confirmation. And this is your registration number with the Connecticut Paid Leave Authority. Should you need to reach us in the future, um, yes, we can reference you by that registration number, but the most frequent way that we will uh, look up your information is by your um, federal tax ID number. And we really wanted to just share now just a few more resources that we've made available on our website. Uh, as we've spoken to the employer community about how do I share the message about Connecticut paid leave? What resources are available to, uh, to us to help share that message? We have been very intentional and have had a wonderful uh, marketing partner that has worked with us to make uh, lots of resources available on our website. So if you go to the website, you'll see a link for resources. If you go to the employer page, you will see all of these resources, an employee rights poster. All of these are PDF format. Uh, they can be printed in color or black and white. Um, you'll see this employee rack card, which is um, intended to be just a, a little narrow insert that you can hand out to your employees that gives them very relevant information about what, does, what is the paid leave program and what does it mean for them. You'll see here in the middle, uh, in the green, the employer toolkit. It is a very comprehensive toolkit that gives you lots of resources, lots of embedded links around material that you can make available in your workplace. And then on the lower part of the screen here, um, if you have uh, mailers that go out with uh, your pay stubs to your employees, you can have this electronic um, mailer be available to go out with your payroll process, or you can print it as another insert. Uh, and then finally, an employee fact sheet uh, that a lot of employers have asked. And uh, while we are in this COVID environment, uh, they have asked for things that can be printed and and pasted uh, uh, on the wall or handed out for employees. So uh, all of these are electronic and available to you uh, for your use and, and resource. So I think now we want to pause. I know it's uh, uh, five minutes before the hour. We wanna make sure that we leave time for questions and answers. Uh, you'll see uh, the key information here on the, on the page, but. Um, I think now, why don't we pause and see what kind of questions have come through Q&A. Oh, thank you, Chris. I'm trying to get myself back on screen here. Um, so the only question I've seen so far was just a question about the family itself. Not, and that was, you know, if I, so essentially, you know, I, I need to take time off because my mom gets sick, but I only need to take a week. Um, but you know, she's older and she may get sick again. Can I take more time off? And the answer is yes. The entitlement for the job protection is up to 12 weeks in a 12 month period. And similarly, the entitlement for income replacement is the same. So if you only use a week in January um, and then your mom gets sick or your spouse or your sibling or whoever gets sick again in March, you have additional entitlements. Most people, in my experience, don't take all 12 weeks of their FMLA leave. You know, they take, well, they can only take what the doctor says they need to begin with. Um, and usually you're talking about a few weeks, maybe um, several weeks for serious health conditions, but they don't usually take it all at once. So if anyone has any other questions, we'd be happy to uh, answer them. It, there's also, as Chris had mentioned, and I kind of jumped the slide a little quickly, but if you go to ctpaidleave.org, there are FAQs, there are videos, there's um, all sorts of information, both about the paid leave program and registration, but also just about the leave laws themselves. And we have um, an, an ever expanding list of FAQs um, that Chris has been in charge of making sure we keep updating. 
And so we've got a lot of information about, I am a clergy member and I have special tax rules. How do I contribute? Or um, I work in multiple states because I'm a regional field person. What are my jobs? And so we have answers to all those questions on our FAQs. And I know there's a lot of information that you shared and we definitely appreciate it. Thank you so much, Aaron and Chris and Amber for facilitating this. And if people missed it in the beginning, uh, I believe that this, the presentation recording will be shared with folks uh, a day or so after this, as well as um, a link to the resources. So people can always watch it if they missed something. Absolutely. Yeah. Our most important message for everyone is if you are a business, and you haven't registered yet, please register as soon as you can. Um, we want to make sure that employers get their accounts set up, get themselves sort of situated within, within the website so that when they do have to remit the contributions, it's a seamless and easy process. There's, there's no need to add stress um, by waiting to the last minute. So register as soon as you can. And if you're supported by a third party administrator, Please also make sure that you're talking with your TPA or payroll provider about registering. <clears throat> Excuse me, many um, employers we know are supported um, by TPAs and they are aware of this. We've been working very closely with the National Payroll Consortium around uh, the awareness of this uh, new law. And so they should be supporting you. Even QuickBooks is fully aware of this and issued an update in December. So. If you use QuickBooks, uh, make sure you've got the, make sure you've put in your updates because they have, have their program set up to help you with this as well. Great. I'm not sure if we, Amber, do we have any more questions or in the, the chat? If not, I think we're coming right we, up. We do not. I think we are all set to wrap up. Okay. Well, thank you again for inviting us. And um, if you, you know, we're always happy to come back. So just well, thank you for know. taking the time to do this. Like I said, we really appreciate it. We had questions from our members, I know. And, um, you know, it's one of those things like, it, I mean, you, we read about it, but until people really had to do it, you know, that's, that's when you start to really start to get questions. So we appreciate you taking this time and, and doing this outreach this is great, you know, so thanks for making yourselves available and, and thanks for making all these resources available to all of us. So we, we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Great. Well, thank you everyone who joined us as well too. And thanks again, Amber, for uh, facilitating this and everyone have a good night. Good night, you everyone. As well. Good night, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.